In this video, we're going to be discussing common resources. Remember that the definition of a common resource is a good that is both rival and non-excludable. Rival means that if one person consumes some of this resource, there's less to go around for other people. Non-excludable means that there's nothing that other consumers or other producers of the good can do to stop someone from uh, consuming that resource. And so there are very low, low barriers to consumption. That creates a situation where the firms have a perverse incentive. They want to exclude, uh, sorry, exploit this common resource more than would be socially optimal. Why do they want to do that? It's because exploiting the resource creates a private gain for the person who exploits it. Um, and any firm that leaves some of the resource unexploited, well, they're just leaving it untouched to be exploited by another firm. So let's go through some examples of that. When you have a common resource, it commonly leads to what's called a tragedy of the commons, a situation where people are consuming too much of this resource. They're consuming it at an unsustainable rate. So for example, ocean fisheries tend to be over harvested so that fish populations will, uh, will tend to collapse. Here's an example of that, the world tuna catch from 1960 to 2005. This is coming out of your textbook. And as you can see, uh, the weight of, of catch in thousands of tons, that's on the left-hand side, that's on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have the year. And observe that in the 1960s, uh, it was possible to catch large tonnages of tuna. That drops off through the 1960s and 1970s as sushi became more popular uh, in the Western world, outside of Japan, outside of China. And then in the 1980s, demand ramped up even more. And as you can see, starting at about 1983 or so, uh, the world catch just drops off a cliff in terms of the available tuna, okay? Why, what's going on there? Well, most of that tuna is being harvested from international waters where it doesn't matter if you, you know, if you are a fisherman, you have no ability to stop the other commercial fishermen from, uh, from pulling tuna out of the sea. And so even though any individual fishermen uh, or even all of them as an industry together, they might collectively like to reduce the total amount of catch that they, um, that they harvest in a given year to make sure that they can stabilize the population of tuna. Um, unfortunately, each individual firm has an incentive to come in and uh, catch as many fish as it can, okay? Unless all of the fishing vessels are behaving responsibly, they can't maintain a, uh, a good sustainable level of, uh, of fish population. Another example would be firms who are, uh, are oil companies. If they're extracting oil from the same deposit, they're going to tend to extract that oil too quickly. Okay, so let me give you a visual example of that. Here you've got two firms, firm A and firm B. The red dotted line there refers to like a lease line that says on the surface, uh, everything to the right of that, that line belongs to firm B. Everything to the left of that line uh, belongs to firm A. Okay, well, unfortunately, as you can see, that dark band below the surface there, that's the oil deposit. Both of these two firms, above ground, they're on different plots of land, but below ground, they are both tapping into the same oil reserve. That means that every barrel of oil that firm A brings to the surface is a barrel of oil that's not there for firm B to be able to bring to the surface. Well, that means they now are kind of in a race with each other. Whichever of those two firms pumps faster is going to get a larger share of the total oil deposit. And so they tend to over harvest this oil, this oil uh, in a couple of different ways. One is that uh, they're going to want to, uh, they're going to have an incentive to build more oil derricks than they necessarily need to. Okay. Every time you build another oil derrick and drill another well down into that oil deposit, that oil is under pressure initially, so that the first oil derrick doesn't have to use any energy, typically, uh, to bring the oil to the surface. But every time you add another oil derrick, you're dissipating some of the pressure underground, and uh, so adding all these extra oil derricks is going to tend to uh, make it so that sooner than you would ordinarily have to, you're going to have to use energy resources to pump the oil to the surface instead of just letting nature uh, push it to the surface for you. Okay, second of all, 
they have an incentive to pump oil faster than they intend to sell it on the market. And if you're going to pump more oil to the surface than you intend to sell on the market, what are you going to have to do with that oil? Where are you going to have to store it? Right. So they have this incentive to build storage facilities above ground. That means they're sinking, sinking real resources into building these things, real money and real labor and raw materials. Well, nature was already providing them with free storage below the surface. Unfortunately, they can't use that storage facility below the surface because they can't trust one another to leave, uh, you know, all the oil there, okay, or leave as much oil there as they're not using currently. Uh, finally, wild animal populations, sometimes those get hunted into extinction or nearly hunted into extinction. Uh, and the big example of this from North America, of course, is the bison. This is a picture from the late 19th century of uh, two men standing on top of and next to a mountain of bison skulls. Okay, Now, in the uh, early 18th century, bison roamed the Great Plains of North America, right? So you'd have these, uh, these bison herds that early settlers moving west described as, in, in certain circumstances, just coating the plains for miles to sea. They were just blackened by all of the bison. However, uh, the, uh, the white settlers had an incentive. Well, first of all, there was no property right excluding the white settlers from hunting these, uh, these bison. Okay. Uh, they were rival good in the sense that every bison you kill is not then available to be, uh, to reproduce and to, uh, you know, provide meat for somebody else. Uh, but they were also non-excludable basically by design. There were no property rights on these bison. Uh, that individual, uh, you know, settlers had to observe. And also the federal government of the United States realized that the Plains Indians were highly dependent on uh, hunting bison. And so to the extent that those bison populations could be brought lower, that put the Plains Indians into a weakened, uh, weaker bargaining position with regards to the federal government. And so there are stories of, um, you know, as trains would cross the, the Great Plains, People would just sit on the decks of the planes with their rifles or with pistols, and they would just shoot bison as they uh, as they went by. They just did it recreationally, even with no intent to harvest the bison for uh, you know any any useful purpose. Okay, so that was a very stark tragedy of the commons. Now it turns out bison have made a comeback in the United States. They started a population of I don't know somewhere in the on the order of twenty to thirty million um, about two hundred years ago. Uh, they were hunted down to somewhere around 10,000 uh, over the course of just a couple of decades. In recent years, their numbers have actually been making a, a decent comeback. They're, I think there's somewhere around half a million or so bison in uh, North America. But they are now raised uh, or owned like cattle. Okay, so that they, they're, well, at least most of the ones that are, are, have not been hunted into uh, near extinction. They're on private property. And they're owned by uh, individual ranchers who will harvest them for their meat and sell it commercially and also sometimes sell hunting permits to, uh, to private hunters who just want to, uh, to shoot a bison. Okay, now that they're private property, their owners have an incentive to make sure that there's plenty of them to go around, just like cattle, right? Cows, we butcher millions of them in the United States every year, but we don't run out of them because they're privately owned and those private owners have an incentive to make sure that they maintain uh, a good population so they can keep selling the meat uh, long into the future. So that's the tragedy of the commons. Uh, how can you get around the tragedy of the commons? We'll talk about a couple of ways. One is just through regulation, okay, command and control. The idea is the owners realize they can't trust each other. The firms that are exploiting this resource realize they can't trust each other. And so they cede some of their, uh, their rights, their property rights over this resource to a third party. And typically that's going to be the government. Now, this can be effective, uh, but it can also, it's not bulletproof, okay? It can fall prey to certain um, weaknesses. One of those is naive regulatory rules. A naive regulatory rule is one where the regulator is trying to do their best to make sure that the, um, the, the resource is um, used sustainably, but they just don't do a very good job of this. A, an example of this would come from 
uh, ocean fisheries and the, the waters off the, the coast of Alaska back in the 1970s and the 1980s. Okay, they were worried about overfishing in those waters. And so the state of Alaska responded to that by shortening the fishing seasons. So you might have a fishing season that lasted for 12 weeks ordinarily, um, but then the, the government of Alaska would pass a, a law saying, okay, we're gonna reduce the, the legal season from 12 weeks to let's say 10 weeks, okay? Well, you can imagine how the commercial fishermen responded. They didn't just catch fewer fish as a response to that. Instead, what they did was they brought larger boats with more people on them and they fished for longer hours over those 10 weeks and they caught just as many fish as they had previously in the 12 weeks. And then the government would respond by reducing the length of the, the fishing season by another week or another two weeks. And the commercial fishermen would respond by just fishing more intensively during those, uh, those eight remaining weeks. And this continued uh, over a period of years to the extent where certain fishing seasons were reduced to being like five days long or three days long. But during that time, navies of commercial fishing vessels would show up and they were enormous and they had, uh, you know, freezer, onboard freezers so that they never had to go into port. They could just, all the fish that they catch, they immediately freeze them and, um, you know, save themselves the trips and that they would be operating more or less 24 hours a day with very large crews who were often sleep deprived. Okay, so they were catching just as many fish, but they were doing it more dangerously and more expensively, more capital intensively than they had been before. Uh, another problem that you can get with regulation of a common resource is regulatory capture. Uh, that is because if the regulator wants to avoid creating naive regulatory rules, what they need is information about the market, right? They need to have good knowledge about this, uh, this industry in order to regulate it. Well, who has the best knowledge about the industry? It's people who are already in the industry. So you're relying on the people that you're trying to regulate to get the information necessary to regulate them. And of course, their incentive is to try to get you as the regulator to uh, make life easier for them, okay? Not to make, uh, make sure that um, resources are used as efficiently as possible for society, okay? So regulatory capture can result in situations where uh, the regulator has ineffectual rules because the, the firms that are being regulated don't want, uh, don't want the regulatory rules to be efficient, okay? And especially in industries where there's some, some turnover, uh, where, for example, in banking, it's not uncommon for uh, someone who works for a regulatory uh, commission for the federal government to, have, to get a job in the banking industry after five years or 10 years at, at their government position. Well, they have an incentive to play nice while they are in the role of regulator so that firms will want to hire them once they leave that role of regulator, okay? Uh, and then finally, you have issues of overlapping or incomplete jurisdiction. Some resources, fisheries could be an example of this. Um, whales are an example of this where in the 18th century and 19th century, whaling took a heavy toll on uh, whale populations and brought a lot of them close to extinction. Now, there are you know, um, uh, whaling uh, treaties that different countries have signed up to agreeing not to harvest whales. The problem is not every country is a signatory and some countries that may have signed those treaties don't really enforce them particularly well. And the problem is whales are migratory animals. And so maybe while they're in the waters off the coast of Mexico and uh, the United States and Canada, perhaps they're safe during that time. But when they go into the waters of countries that haven't signed these treaties like Japan, well, then they're in danger, okay? And so the, the rest of the world um, refraining from harvesting these whales more or less just makes, there more, uh, makes it so that there's more of them available for the Japanese. And I believe Iceland is another country where they, they still practice whaling. They can then... Um, just harvest more whales than they otherwise would have, okay? So regulation can be effective, but sometimes uh, it's not effective. It's not a perfect solution. Uh, there are cases where a common resource can be turned into a private good. Technology 
uh, might advance to make it so that the good is excludable. And now that it, it becomes a, a private good instead of a common good. An example of this would be farm raised fish, right? So we now have the technology. It's not super high tech uh, technology. You can basically um, put nets in the ocean and you seed those nets with baby fish and then you raise them in that area. They cannot migrate and you have an easy time making sure that you're the only one who's actually harvesting fish uh, from those nets. And that's a way of getting around this tragedy of the commons. You're not going, uh, you're not going to overfish uh, waters that are being um, farmed okay, by, by private firms. Now, there are certainly other issues that, that you can run into um, with, uh, you know, what would you say, negative externalities with farm-raised fish, okay? Uh, so they're not necessarily a panacea, but one thing that they do uh, effectively is uh, to avoid the tragedy of the commons. You can also have effective government policy that does a good job of making a, uh, a common resource behave like a private good or making the firms who harvest that resource behave as though it's a private good. An example of this is uh, tradable fishing licenses, sometimes called individual trading quotas or ITQs. Ultimately, this is what they moved towards in Alaska once it became abundantly clear that the rules that they were uh, imposing just uh, you know, we're giving them absurd results in Alaska. Eventually, what they did was they said, okay, we're going to limit the total amount of fish that you're just allowed to catch, okay? Instead of limiting the number of hours that you have available to fish, we will limit the number of fish that you can legally pull out of the water. And then in the same way that we've talked about tradable uh, pollution permits, they allowed firms to trade their, their rights to uh, pull out a certain amount of fish from the waters. Okay, what that allowed to happen was you get the same amount of catch uh, at the cheapest price possible because if you're a firm that is operating, like a, operating at a high cost, you can either catch the fish yourself and sell them for a profit or you can sell off your rights to catch the fish. Okay, and so what that tends to do is it moves those quotas into the hands of uh, lower cost fishing uh, vessels, okay? Um, and so this is, a, this is not from Alaska, this graph here, but uh, New Zealand did the same thing. And you can see in 1986, they introduced their, uh, their ITQ system. And this is the, on the Y axis, you've got thousands of tons of uh, fish caught in New Zealand waters. And you can see that once they imposed those restrictions, they were able to bring fishing to a more sustainable level so that the population of fish grew. That allowed the government of, of New Zealand each year to uh, increase the total number of um, permits that they, uh, that they allocated and allowed the population of fish to, to grow sustainably over time. Okay, uh, so that is one you know, one method that the government can use to, uh, to make the, the situation of the tragedy of the commons less of an issue. But there are certain contexts in which privatization is gonna be difficult or even impossible. So you could think of, um, you know, the, the Earth's atmosphere as being a common resource, right? We breathe it, but it's also uh, a place where we emit some of the um, particulate matter from our production processes, carbon, for example, or nitrous oxide. Well, it's difficult to think of a way of privatizing the air, okay? It's not like uh, farming, uh, fish farming, where you could just put nets up in the air and say, well, you know, as long as you're breathing your own air within that net, you can emit all the pollution you want to. We don't have that technology, right, to stop pollution from moving from my chunk of air into your chunk of air. So privatization is not gonna work in all contexts, but where it's possible, it's the best solution because it moves the good from being a common, common resource to being a private good. And as we've discussed over the course of the semester, uh, markets usually do a, a, a quite a good job of, uh, of providing private goods. So that's it for common resources. Uh, in the next video, we will discuss public goods.